It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 103, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Todd Nichols is the head grower at Nichols Farm and Orchard in Marengo, Illinois, about 65 miles northwest of Chicago. Founded in 1977 by Todd's parents, Nichols Farm currently produces about 260 acres of vegetables and 40 acres of apples. Nichols Farm markets to some 200 restaurants, 15 farmers markets each week, and a 450-member CSA. Todd digs into what a farm this size looks like and the sorts of investments they've made in equipment and infrastructure to ensure that they can complete the large amount of work that often needs to be done in a very short amount of time. We talk about the low-density approach to cropping at Nichols Farm, the workflow they use to provide outstanding service to their restaurant and farmer's market customers, and the ways their four different farming locations create advantages for disease management and coping with the weather. Nichols Farm is certified to the Food Alliance Sustainability Standard, but is not certified organic. And Todd shares his reasons why, and how he farms differently because of it, and some of the other ways that Nichols Farm has taken a green approach to their agricultural production. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Vermont Compost, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. And by Farmers Web, making it simple for farms to work with wholesale buyers such as restaurants, retail stores, and schools. Farmers Web software streamlines your wholesale operations, making it easier to work with your buyers and with more buyers overall. FarmersWeb.com. And by Farm Commons. Strong, resilient, sustainable farm businesses are built on a solid legal foundation. Farm Commons provides practical legal resources to help farmers understand and respond to how the law affects them. Free guides and tutorials available online at farmcommons.org. Todd Nichols, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Chris, thanks for having me. I'm a big fan and uh, excited to hear your voice in person. So glad that you could join us here today in early January. I'd, I'd like you to tell us about Nichols Farm and Orchard. Give us kind of the lay of the land, where you guys are located, how much you're farming, kind of all of those details that sort of set the stage for the rest of the conversation. Sure. Well, uh you know, uh, our, our farm is a, a family farm. My dad actually, and my mom and dad started the farm in 1977. They moved out here to Marengo, Illinois, which is uh, about 65 miles northwest of Chicago. So uh, at the time, both of them worked for the airlines and, uh, and they moved, they wanted to move in the country. And my dad was a, a gardening enthusiast. And so they wanted to live somewhere that was commutable to the airport at O'Hare. And, uh, you know, so Marengo was about an hour, uh, an hour drive from O'Hare and uh, very commutable. And uh, so that's where they ended up buying a 10 acre lot. And uh, at the time, uh, my dad jumped right into a big garden and, uh, you know, he really aspired to have uh, kind of the, the hippie mentality, self-sustain, you know, live off of the land while, you know, living in, you know, working in the city at the time. So, uh, so he was doing that for, uh, right from the get go, he bought a cow and had pigs and, uh, and, uh, sheep. And, uh, you know, he had a big vegetable garden, much bigger than he needed. So I always tell people, uh, you know, we, can, my dad started as a uh, market gardener without a market, you know? So, uh, he uh, essentially was growing way more than he knew what to do with. And, uh, you know, he started off completely organic and, uh, you know, and had uh, that idealistic view on, uh, on growing produce. And, uh, and at the time he, uh, he was bringing his extra produce to his co-workers at the airport. And, um, you know, going back in the seventies, uh, farmers markets were not a big thing. There was uh, only a handful of them in the whole Metro area. And, uh, so uh, a coworker, my dad said, uh, told him, you know, hey, you got all this produce. Why don't you go to a farmers market? And at the time, my dad had barely even heard of farmers markets, you know, let alone been to any or even thought of vending in any. And uh, he was fortunate in, uh, enough in uh, 1978, he got into the Evanston farmers market, and uh, and we still sell there today. After uh, this will be our uh, 39th year. So. Uh, you know, that's kind of how we got started. And, uh, you know, from there we've grown my dad, uh, I'm 35 right now. And, uh, and I have two brothers who are 45 and, uh, 38. And, uh, we all grew up here on this farm mostly. And, uh, you know, and, uh, we've grown into the business. I always tell people that I, uh, 
grew up in a farmer's market, you know, and I literally did. I was that little kid in the back of the pickup truck playing all day, you know, you knew all the customers and all the vendors. And, uh, and to this day, I, I still do, you know, but going back to the farm. So, uh, so he started on the 10 acre farm and, uh, and garden more or less. And, uh, after he started a little production, uh, he managed that as a, a second hobby job for till about 1989. And, uh, so about 10 years that he did it as a second career. And, uh, you know, over time he, he acquired a few adjacent lots and, uh, and grew a little bit more. And by the time I was in uh, high school or so in the mid nineties, you know, we, he was farming, uh, we were farming. I mean, we were always involved as kids, but, uh, he was farming, uh, about, uh, about 80 acres and, uh, and, you know, and we were doing farmer's markets strictly almost, you know, strictly farmer's markets. We had a, a busy schedule we would go to uh you know farmers market every day and uh and uh that's pretty much what grew the farm to where we're at and uh you know and and as my brothers and i grew up and became adults uh i went to school for horticulture in iowa iowa state and uh you know as as we all grew up and came back to the farm we had to grow the farm substantially to accommodate multiple families so today we uh We've uh, through uh, 16 or 18 land acquisitions. My uh, my dad and us have have got uh, four or 530 acres, and uh, and we uh, we all make our living from the farm. You know, so we're supporting our three or four families as well as all our employees and everybody else. Um, on that 530 acres, we uh, we're farming about uh, 260 acres or more of vegetables. And, uh, and, uh, we have, uh, a lot of perennial fruits like apple trees, uh, maybe, uh, 40 acres of apples and, uh, pears and peaches and plums and, and just about anything you can plant. We try and, uh, blackberries, we do a lot of raspberries, strawberries, uh, blueberries, uh, pretty much anything, you name it. And, uh. So that's kind of the lay of our land. Uh, you know, uh, my dad started off the farm completely organic. And uh, as he got into fruit trees, it was kind of where he realized that he couldn't grow strictly organic. You know, so uh, so we don't abide by strict organics. We, uh, we actually carry uh, a Food Alliance certified sustainable as a 30, third party entity that, uh, you know, rates us on our our practices, but, uh, you know, we're a little more diverse than, uh, than a lot of strictly organic farms would be. And, uh, and, you know, when you're heavily invested into something like apple orchard, you know, uh, growing strictly organic in the Midwest is a pretty risky business. I've known a few people that, uh, have, uh, have gotten out, have gotten into it, certified acreage or orchard and gotten out of it. And, uh, so, you know, having that diversity has kind of led us to a place where we are, you know, we're not conventional and we're not organic, but I like to think, you know, we're somewhere well in between and, and we employ a, a, a lot of organic practices and I'm always striving in that direction. But at the same time, I'm accepting of, of some of uh, the realities of, uh, of business that, uh, you know, uh, I, we probably wouldn't grow 60 acres of sweet corn if we were certified organic. You know, we'd probably just scratch that off the off the list. You know, and same with apple trees and, and a few other crops that we just uh, it would be tricky. So, uh, you know, we uh, our our main business uh, had always our the backbone of our farm had been farmers markets, and uh, you know we've always done as many as we could really. And uh, today we go to 15 every week, and uh, and those are a major part of what we do. Um, but uh, as the uh, as the trends have changed, and it, as we've grown the farm, uh, you know, farmers markets are still a big part. But we also uh, 40 40 to 50 percent of our uh, sales come direct from restaurants. We uh, we run a five day a week, uh, delivery route throughout Chicago land and, uh, serve, uh, close to 200 restaurants. Um, I also, in the last, uh, 
in the last six years, I've gotten into CSA, which uh, has kind of been my personal little pet project. And uh, I've been working on that. And uh, last year, we had about 450 members. Um, we offer a you know, pretty full season, including the fall. So we're doing up to 28 weeks of uh, 29 weeks of CSA with uh, with fruit included. So a big part of what we do and a, and a big part of why we're not strictly organic is that we grow a lot of fruit. You know, so uh, fruit is a big part of our CSA. And I think of it as a, uh, you know, something that a lot of our competition doesn't offer their own fruit often, let alone fruit every week. So, so CSA, you know, we're very much doing the marketing model that all the guys in our industry are doing the farmer's market, the restaurant and the CSA. And, uh, you know, we're doing it, uh, as big and as uh, best we can with, the, uh, you know, with a family backing behind it. So it is truly a family business, but, uh, we, uh, employ quite a few people too. Todd, I'm really interested to dig into the farming to start with because 260 acres is substantial, a lot. Uh, I mean, certainly, I think larger than anybody that we've had on the show to date. You tell us what 260 acres of vegetable production looks like. What kind of systems are you using to, to get things done? Can you kind of let, walk us through a crop and the kind of equipment that you would use, um, the way you've got things set up to to manage that scale of operation well uh you know uh, we've slowly grown into into our size and uh you know a big part of it is that incremental growth over the years uh you know uh a big uh, a big reinvestment that my dad's always put at high priority is having tractors so we've got a lot of tractors of all sizes and and uh, of all you know from orchard sprayer tractors to uh, to uh, several high clearance tractors, I think we have 14 uh, tractors. You know, so uh, a big uh, a big thing with that is uh, when you have an opportunity to do a lot, we can really get a lot done. You know, so in the spring, if uh, if you have a short window and you need to, to you know spread fertilizer or you know work field transplanting, we've got you know plastic lane going on. We've got as many guys on as many tractors doing as many things that need to be done, you know, and you end up being a lot more productive. If you, uh, if you limit yourself to one or two tractors, you're limited to what they, you know, you can do on two tractors. So uh, that is a big part. Um, you know, uh, em- employees are a huge part of it. You know, if we didn't have a sizable crew, we surely couldn't uh, do as much as we're doing. How many employees do you have? You know, we uh, we have about 50 people working, uh, you know, in the field. Uh, I think we have about 30, uh, 30 people working. And then I've got uh, 10, 10, there's about 10 people that are on salary, you know, year-round employees. And, uh, and those guys are, uh, you know, diverse, uh, you know, a mechanic, uh, you know, a couple of older guys that drive tractors mostly. Um, I've got a crew uh, foreman who is, uh, you know, very bilingual and and pretty much in charge of all the the laborers. And then we've got uh, several people in the marketing department, and uh, you know, and then of course my family and my brothers. So it takes it takes that, and we're always looking for more help. I really am always looking for more. But back to the back to the growing, you know, a lot of that acreage is eaten up in in a few crops, really. And uh, we could definitely cut out our acreage quite a bit if we didn't grow a lot of sweet corn, which we grow 50, 60 acres of sweet corn on most years. And uh, and I do a lot of beans. We uh, we harvest beans with the oxbow. And uh, so uh, beans are a big part of our rotation. They're also a big part of, uh, you know, just uh, we over the years, we've been known for our beans at a lot of markets. So we sell a lot of beans. I probably plant more than I need, and uh, and that's kind of our philosophy on almost everything we grow is that we plant more than we need because uh, you know we find it much uh, much better to to have extra and not have to harvest it than to run out and you know lost potential in that way. So in most cases, most of the the cost of growing is in the labor of picking it. 
So if, if we just simply have too much, like in sweet corn, uh, you know, we, uh, we just don't pick it. But, uh, you know, we're also filling the space in a lot of ways. So when we're growing crops, uh, we always, we're growing more than we need, but uh, we're also utilizing our farm uh, to its fullest potential in a lot of ways. You know, and, and I do aspire to put more land out of production, but uh, that hasn't always been the case that we've been able to take a whole lot of land out of production. You know, another part of why we eat up so much acreage is that we're into relatively low density. Um, you know, uh, we started off with very wide rows and, uh, you know, some crops we keep at wide rows for a multitude of reasons, uh, airflow, ease of harvest, ease of machinery, ease of cultivation. So, uh, so we actually use a 42 inch row on a lot of things like sweet corn and beans and, uh, you know, a lot of crops that most people would grow on a 30 inch row. We grow on a 42 inch row. And, uh, you know, I curse, uh, well, and, and it's hard to change a system like that when you, uh, after you got it started, because you've got equipment that lined up and it, it, it that 42 inch row kind of all goes back to, uh, some of my dad's original equipment and, uh, and then it just kind of multiplied from there. So we've, we've accepted the 42 inch row on a lot of stuff. And then uh, a lot of crops we grow uh, on a on a three row uh, three row bed with a 21 inch row, you know, which is still wider than a lot of people would grow a lot of those carrots and greens and lettuce and uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, but the wideness is not necessarily always a negative for us. It was certainly something as we as my farm evolved. You know, we started off with with 10 inch rows, and then we ended up growing up to to 12, and then to 15 for exactly those reasons that you mentioned uh, around airflow and and therefore the disease control that that provided and really changed our disease situation in a, you know especially in crops like carrots which we were we had we were having a real problem with alternaria in those and then it also really did make the weed control so much easier it really does make cultivating a lot easier and if, you know if you're manually cultivating or hoeing uh, it makes it easier too so as long as, the way I see it is uh, we could be more productive, you know, jam fortier style, and we could really maximize our, our, our production per acre. But as long as we have a lot of acres, we might as well spread it out a little bit. And there are some positives, you know, of, uh, of course, if, uh, if land is, uh, <clears throat> you know, something that is hard to come by, that's uh, not something that uh, everyone can look forward to running like that but uh for us it works you mentioned that you're using the oxbow bean harvester which is a mechanical bean picker do you use a lot of mechanized harvest aids um you know uh traditionally no we're uh you know we've gotten uh we're we're working our way there in fact i just got a uh a corn harvester uh delivered this month with the uh, uncertainty of the the future of labor in agriculture, uh, I figured, uh, you know, no better time than now to uh, to make sure that we uh, mechanize a little more. I'm also uh, thinking seriously about getting a root harvester. You know, uh, one thing about us is that we are uh, we're in a location that has always had a lot of labor. You know, uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, there's a there's a horticultural industry that uh, is kind of out here at the edge of Chicago land that, uh, you know, there's a lot of jobs for, uh, you know, mostly migrant and Latino guys that, uh, you know, are working in the, uh, in the horticulture industry. So in our area, there's a ton of nurseries and sod farms and uh, not so many vegetable farms, but, uh, you know, it's also home base to a whole lot of landscapers and, uh, that type of company that, uh, you know, generally hires Latino guys. And, uh, and not that I have anything opposed to non-Latino guys, but the reality is the people that apply at our farm are mostly Latino guys. And, uh, and most of our, our field harvest crew, uh, consists of that, you know? So, so that has been one reason why we've never been pushed into mechanization completely. Um, you know, well, of course, we're, you know, we're growing a huge variety. So there's very few crops that we could justify it. Anyway, I mean, we barely grow enough of 
any one crop to justify mechanization with, uh, you know, but uh, the corn and the beans and, uh, and a few other things, and those options are out there. You'll never escape the, the need for hand labor in, in this industry, at least on our level and our diversity. You know, we grow, we grow so many crops, you know, we, uh, we often tell people, you know, we have over a thousand varieties of crops grown on the farm. And, uh, and that's true. You know, every year my seed order will consist of maybe 400 items. And then our orchard, we grow, uh, 243 varieties of apples and, uh, you know, 40 types of pears and pretty much everything everything in every catalog we've tried and an awful lot of them stick. If we found a way to make them profitable, we, we really, you know, a, a big thing of, of our appeal at, at any farmer's market is our sheer diversity. We really, you know, strive to grow everything. So, you know, so many of those things are just not, you know, you're just not going to do mechanical, uh, you know, artichoke harvesters and cucumber harvesters are beyond me for mechanical. And, you know, so it, it becomes uh, tricky, but we are fortunate to have that, uh, that labor force that uh, has made it possible. Yeah. And especially, you know, when you talk about coming from a neighborhood where there's a lot of horticultural production already, because even though it's not necessarily vegetables and, and even though knowing how to, how to, you know, put trees in pots or how to prune berries doesn't necessarily translate to how to pick peppers in a specific sense. I think that that similar work and that way of working is really important in, in terms of, of finding good people who are, well, experienced farm laborers, people who get it from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it is a trick. And, and we've burned through a lot of people over the years that, uh, that didn't quite get it. But, uh, you know, uh, it'll be a constant uh, constant need and uh, you know like i said uh, who knows what the future brings in the uh, in the labor market around here so so i am pushing to mechanize a bit and uh, you know but we'll never escape it you mentioned doing you know some hand weed control now obviously that's not the the only thing you're doing for weed control you got, you said you have several high clearance tractors so i assume you're using those for cultivating uh yeah Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, cultivating or, uh, or spraying or, uh, you know, we've got a couple of the, uh, the John Deere, uh, 5100, uh, series, you know, so they're uh, 100 horsepower makes them pretty versatile. Um, as far as, uh, you know, their clearance is a little high for a few, uh, implements, but, uh, for cultivation, they're nice. And, uh, you know, I, I have, uh, a couple older guys that uh, pretty much take care of most of the cultivation on the farm. And, uh, you know, uh, and that is the biggest thing, you know, I mean, uh, our weed control, the basis of it starts with uh, hopefully a clean rotation. And then, uh, you know, cultivation is, uh, is the biggest backbone. And uh, I wouldn't say we have any magic trick. In fact, in fact, we probably have some of the weediest fields of a lot of farms you've had on here. You know, uh, and things things get lost in the weeds occasionally, and that's that's part of it. You know, you miss a you miss a beat, and uh, all of a sudden you uh, you lost the battle, and yields suffered, and prices went up. You know, but uh, a big part of uh, making it work for us is that uh, you know we're able to uh, tweak a profit out of most any crop, even. Uh, Sometimes if uh, if it looks like it's lost in the weeds, you'll be amazed. But it looks like after a nice frost and all the weeds die, you know. So so occasionally I get discouraged in that department. But uh, we've gone to more transplants over the years, you know, uh, if there's things that I can transplant. You know, for years we tried direct seeding lettuce more and more, and that was just always, we, if you didn't hoe it, there was no hope. You know, so I've gone to a lot more transplants and we're able to cultivate a lot better now, I think. And then there are some crops that we are, we're not, you know, we're not stuck to organic. So, you know, so some crops I am able to, uh, you know, use some herbicides that, uh, that make it equitable, you know, like, uh, like sweet corn. I, I'm not trying to grow corn organically for a multitude of reasons. And, uh, if you're not trying to grow it organically, uh, you're left with the option of, uh, 
you know, post-emergent herbicides are, uh, are big in a, in a few crops. You know, most vegetables, there's really nothing out there anyway. But uh, when it comes to, like, corn and beans, I, I can utilize some of those and uh, if, I, if I have to. So I'm curious how you make that choice. I mean, I know, so for me, I came into agriculture through organics. That was, you know, that was my, my interest was an environmental interest. And the first farm yeah. that I worked on was organic and, and almost every operation that I was, that I've been a part of was, was organic and certainly everything that I've managed. And that was, and when I say we were organic, it was a, it was a defining part of our operation. And it sounds like right. that was something that was true with your parents. How have you guys, I guess, how do you thread that needle, I guess, on a, on a decision-making basis? I mean, when you're looking at something and going, well, I could cultivate this or, you know, I mean, obviously you, you're not doing it. Well, I shouldn't say obvious. It, I'm guessing that you're not doing it. You're not standing there looking at a crop of corn, making a decision about whether you're going to cultivate it or spray it. It's something you, a management decision that you've made. But how do you... How have you made that decision of where to, where to, to hew to organic practices and where to say, you know what, we're, we're going to go, we're going to go a little bit over here. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, something uh, I deal with often and uh, you know, it is tricky and uh, you know, and then we probably take it more crop by crop really. Um, you know, there are crops that I know that we can grow without herbicides and uh, or fungicides and uh, you know, insecticides even. And uh and and those are generally the crops that I feel like we can go into. Now, growing a lot of corn, I know that for one, I'm not going to get the varieties I want untreated. You know, uh, I know that if I did manage to grow corn that was weed weed free enough to get a yield, I might have an insect infestation that'll make it unmarketable anyway. So I'm weighing all those options, and I and. And I'm just, you know, accepting of the fact that we're not going to grow sweet corn organically and, and try and compete on the, the market that we do. Because, uh, you know, at the, at the farmer's market level, uh, you know, I have competition who's completely, uh, you know, non-organic. And I have some organic, but when it comes to a crop like sweet corn, there's almost no organic competition because nobody's doing it. Because it's just, you know, I mean, I know people doing it, but they're not doing it on any scale that they're the guy that's got a lot of corn. You know, I mean, at our market, we sell, you know, I sell six bins of corn at one of my markets every week. And if I, if I have a beat where I, a week where, where it's, uh, you know, 40% infested with worms, then, uh, then, you know, it cuts that tail in half and, uh, you know, it's just, uh, so, so I take it crop by crop. And now with fruiting vegetables, like, tomatoes and peppers and, you know, an awful lot of things, I know that I can grow pretty much organically, you know, in, in most cases. And, you know, transparency is a big thing, you know, in the, in the market clientele, we find that uh, there are a percentage of people who just will not buy from us until we carry a certified organic stamp of their approval. They will not buy from us. And, uh, and that's okay. And, uh, you know, but the reality is the uh, the majority of people will, and uh, and and we try and be transparent about it. You know, we uh, we carry the the certified sustainable uh, you know stamp, and uh, and we explain what that entails. And uh, you know, we're like you said, threading the needle of of organic or conventional is a uh, is a fine line, and uh, it becomes very tricky. And, uh, but, you know, uh, I do strive for, uh, organic practices wherever applicable and, uh, and without, uh, limiting ourselves completely to such, you know, having the orchard is really kind of the Achilles heel of, of, of the organic thing for us. And, and as long as half of our farm is in orchard, I'll never be certified organic. So am I completely limited to that? No, you know, and, uh, and I know that probably burns a lot of people and uh, that are practicing strict organics, you know, but uh, it's kind of a realistic outlook on things, in my opinion, you know, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to do away with all of, uh, you know, the conveniences of modern agriculture and, uh, 
yet, uh, you know, at the same time, I do want to produce a clean product as best I can. So uh, it becomes tricky. Tell me a little bit more about what the Food Alliance certification entails. Uh, Food Alliance is uh, out of Washington, and uh, we started carrying them as uh, as a third party audit because uh, because one of our markets wanted us to have a third party you know certifier, and it turned out that half of the people at the Green City Market in Chicago couldn't be certified organic, you know so. So, uh, you know, when you're talking fruit guys from Michigan and stuff, none of them could be certified organic. So we found Food Alliance as a alternative that gave us some market appeal. And uh, but what they entail is, uh, you know, they have a they have a few hard line uh, rules like no GMOs, um, no pesticides off of uh a list of what they consider to be highly toxic. You know, we don't use organophosphates, no neonicotinoids. Um, you know, there's a list of, of products like that you can't grow. Um, but uh, they also grade you heavily on your soil and water conservation, um, your, your ecological and environmental conservation. You know, of our 530 acres, about 100 acres is in pretty much conservation land. And, uh, and that scored well, you know, uh, in fact, uh, you know, the certifying agent came out and, and she was out here, uh, one time she, you know, she told me how she had to, had to deny that stamp to some organic guys who were farming fence row to fence row, you know, but, uh, using organic practices, but what was the real ecological impact of, of that, you know, are you, are you addressing the fact that there are other components involved with the ecology or farm, you know, like the environmental and the wildlife, but, uh, you know, so they also grade you on your, uh, your human resources, you know, so, uh, they look deep into our, uh, our labor policies and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, and, and want to make sure that you're, uh, you're, you're treating your employees safe and fair and, uh, you know, so it's kind of a well-rounded outlook on sustainability without, you know, it, without uh, strict organic policies, you know. So it, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a far cry from, uh, you know, uh, what I consider strictly conventional. But, uh, you know, it's also something that, uh, you know, it's a leg to stand on when a customer comes up at a farmer's market and says, you know, are you guys certified organic? Um, no, we're not. But we, we're, we're Food Alliance certified sustainable. We grow an awful lot of things without pesticides. Um, we grow some crops that we, you know, we wouldn't grow organically. And, uh, and that's part of why we operate the way we do. And, uh, and uh, until the market drives us a different way, you know, uh, we, uh, we're comfortable with that. Tell me a little bit more about your marketing approach. I mean, you've got you've got the CSA, you've got the farmers markets, you've got wholesale. You're doing all of those on a really large scale. I mean, you said 450 CSA members. I mean, that's nothing to that's nothing to to disrespect there. But 20 farmers markets and 200 wholesale customers. Um, how do you guys manage that? I mean, yeah, that, it's, I mean uh, wow, it's uh, you know, it's uh, it's tricky and. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say we, uh, there's always room for improvement on everything. It's kind of a learning curve every year. You know, uh, the local restaurant uh, scene has really uh, exploded in the last 10 to 15 years. So, you know, uh, we went from less than 5% of our growth to, uh, to, you know, nearly 50% of our growth is direct to restaurants. You know, so... Uh, so in that end of the business, we uh, we have uh, two full-time delivery guys who uh, operate uh, refrigerated trucks, and they uh, you know go on a route every day, and uh, and pretty much cover the entire metro area. Um, you know, I have uh, two people that fill orders in the barn every or in the packing shed every uh, every night. You know, we do that overnight, 
because we're offering a very next day service. So unlike a lot of guys doing this, we our cutoff is uh, three, four in the morning before the truck gets on the road. You know, so if you're uh, if you're a sous chef that just closed out on on Friday night and you ran out of you know sunchokes or rutabaga or whatever, and uh, and you want to place an order at two in the morning, it's going to be on our truck by five in the morning, and it's going to be on the road, and you're going to get it by noon or so the next day. So we're really kind of pushing that super service to the restaurant, and uh, and that is uh, you know a big part of uh, what we do now. Of the 200 restaurants, there's all size restaurants in there. And, uh, you know, we're lucky to have a few that are really major supporters that, you know, spend, uh, you know, substantial, you know, so there's quite a variation in deliveries. So from everywhere from, we don't have a, we don't have a minimum delivery as we're offering a premier service, you know, but we do offer such variety that we rarely would need a minimum delivery, you know, so. So deliveries go anywhere from, you know, $50 to uh, $1,500. And, and a lot of restaurants are buying four days a week. And we might go to the same restaurant four days a week. So uh, so they feel like they're getting the absolute best, freshest every day. They're not buying a lot more than they need and sitting around on it. And, uh, you know, we're also, we're, we're in the city seven days a week. So there's always, you know, that potential to... Uh, to get it to them if we need to, but we're really catering to the restaurants and, uh, and trying to, you know, we do a lot of custom growing, you know, we grow, grow a lot of crops that we just wouldn't grow for, for market even because, uh, the limited demand, but, um, but serving the restaurants, uh, the scene has, uh, you know, it has changed our crop lineup quite a bit. You know, there are crops that we used to, we used to do, uh, you know, like sunchokes or something that we've always grown sunchokes and it didn't take much to have too many sunchokes, you know, at a market, <laughs> you, we might sell a few, but, you know, but as the, as the restaurant scene has gotten into it as a storage crop, you know, we grow uh, about two acres of sunchokes now and I sell them all winter and it's a huge crop for us, you know, and it's a crop I can grow organically really well. And, uh, you know, so it's one of those things that, we just wouldn't have used to grow. I know that on my farm, we, you know, winters were nice because a lot of our, our crops like beets and carrots and rutabagas, we, we would have harvested them all in the fall. We'd wash, you know, a couple of weeks supply and have them in the cooler. And so we were, you know, when somebody would call and order, you know, five cases of beets, we walked into the cooler and pulled out five cases of beets, put them on the truck really easy. Um, during the summer, and I think this is true of most small market farms, we would, you know, we would actually wait until somebody ordered their five cases of kale before we went out and harvested the five cases of kale. And was actually, that was an right. important part of our model. I mean, clearly, if you're, if you're accepting orders at four in the morning to be delivered that same day, you're not doing that. How are you guys managing your, your harvest and post-harvest handling and, and all of that packing? How do you decide how much you're going to pick and, and, yeah, just I guess just walk us through that. Yeah, well, uh, you know it's a steady flow, and uh, and we uh, we harvest uh, six days a week, you know. But uh, a big part of what kept the every day always having a supply on hand is that we go to farmers markets seven days a week. So we go to we go to fifteen a week, and uh, you know, and and having that demand for the markets is always there. So there's always a need to have some of everything. Now, restaurants get first pick. So if we didn't have enough on inventory that in the cooler, uh, you know, we, uh, we just don't have it at the market, you know, but uh, if you ha if you do, if you do have some lead time, you know, it helps, you know, so not that everybody's putting their order in at two in the morning. A lot of guys are a day ahead. So you do have a rough feeling of what you need. And we call out to, to our crew chief in the field and, uh, and arrange to have uh you know, special orders met. But in general, we try and have, uh, you know, an inventory that, uh, that is always on hand. And that's where it becomes very tricky because uh, it produces a little more waste than, uh, than we'd like. And, uh, you know, and waste is kind of part of the biz. I, I wish there was a way to, to do away with it, but uh, the reality seems to be that 
if you didn't have a, enough, you know, you, you lost a lot of opportunity loss. So, so we do have waste and, uh, you know, and certain crops are just not that, you know, just not that popular anyway, but, uh, but in general, we're picking every day. And and we know that there are three days a week that are kind of surge days where we know we need a lot of this or that. And the Saturday is the big one, of course. But uh, but the markets are flexible. You know, that's the good thing is that after the restaurant, that's part of why we fill our orders at, you know, done by four in the morning is that uh, we know what's left for all the markets because there's just not always enough of everything for everybody, you know, so. So by getting the restaurant orders out of the way as a priority, you know, uh, we're able to run the markets out of that. And, uh, you know, generally there's enough to go around. How are you guys actually managing the marketing to the restaurants? Is, and, and, I'm, and I guess I'm looking at both on a, from an outreach perspective, but also just on a, on a day-to-day basis. Are you guys using any kind of software uh, to let people know about availability and facilitate ordering? Or is, are you guys still doing going old school on that with, with emails and phone calls or fax machines. I've put a lot of thought into the potential for, uh, you know, having that software and the, and the need to be updated often, but we really are just kind of doing it old school and, uh, you know, we have email apps and, uh, weekly email lists and, uh, and taking orders by email. And, uh, that kind of leaves you the most flexibility and when you have a, a very fluid product line, it becomes, uh, you know, it's much easier to change your product list on, a, on an email or a spreadsheet than it is to, to go into a program that you have to change it a lot, you know. So we are kind of old school in that respect. And, uh, and we've, uh, you know, gotten a little more high tech with our invoicing and everything, but, but still, uh, we're not overcomplicating it, to tell you the truth. You know, uh, as far as uh, outreach, uh, you know, a big part of why we've been able to get our name out there to so many chefs is uh, is through farmers markets and uh, being part of uh, all the the city markets that are the most you know happening uh, city markets really has brought you know a lot of chefs come to the market, look around, and see who they want to deal with. You know, and uh, and uh, Starting those relationships like that has uh, been a big part of it. Um, and uh, another thing is having those personal relationships with the chefs rather than the restaurants. You know, so a lot of restaurants come and go. And uh, and chefs are, you know, still in the industry. So we've had a lot of clients that were, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at it like the chef's the client, uh, you know, they move on and, uh, and often move up. So they bring us to new restaurants, maybe better opportunities, um, you know, uh, spreading the word through a restaurant like that. Uh, you know, you'll be a sous chef at, a, at one restaurant that we deal with and we know personally, and then they move on and now they're a head chef at an next restaurant. So, so that kind of organic growth has really been the core of, of how we've grown into it. And I think matching that with the uh, service that, uh, that they feel good about is probably what's kept us, uh, you know, in business in the in the restaurant, um, but there seems to be no magic, uh, you know, no magic trick for us. Uh, you know, uh, one thing is that we do offer that next day service, and uh, and we generally have the supply to meet uh, the demand. You know, uh, if you're if you're a very small operation and you and you don't have it, you know, you're gonna leave them disappointed often, and uh, so we try not to do that. You know, but uh, been able to we've been able to nurture the restaurant business along you know quite well and um you know things like microgreens we do a full greenhouse of microgreens and and stuff like that just you know it, it it doesn't take too long to figure out you know to change your operation sure in farming uh you can't you can't change it tomorrow it might take a year to 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 change what you're doing but uh you know give yourself a year and you can change direction and do what you need to be doing to to make it work. But, uh, you know, for logistics, no, we don't do anything that is that creative. And of course you're at, at 15 markets a week. I said 20 earlier, but you just said 15. So I'm going to go with that. Yeah. It's about 15. It changes a little bit, but you guys, 
are obviously delegating some of your marketing to other people. And um, can you tell us how that goes? Because for me, again, and I, I'll speak from my experience in the farms that I worked on, having the farmer at the market was usually a pretty important part of how we sold our produce. Um, are yeah. You, oh, yeah. How do you guys how do you guys handle that with 15 markets a week? You know, traditionally, we've always tried to have uh, one family member at each market, you know, and uh, luckily we do have, you know, I have two brothers and my parents involved because my parents are getting old now and not doing as much. They don't go to markets at all. We all go to market on Saturday. That's kind of uh, our big market day. We go to four, we did five markets Saturday this year and, uh, you know, but we do try and have uh, a good representation at each market. So I have my older brother, Chad, is uh, he's not as much interested in farming as much as marketing. So he uh, he definitely uh, he does his share of markets and goes to market every day. That's his job. He runs a lot of our markets. And then we have another full time guy who's a great attitude and, uh, you know, enjoys running markets well. And he's been with us for 12 years and uh, and he runs the other half of the markets. So. So there is always somebody reasonable at each market. You know, of course, the markets that we go to, uh, you know, we do uh, we do 14, 15 a week. And uh, and over the years, we've tried 30 or 40 markets probably, you know. But the reality is there's just so many markets out there that are just not worth going to, especially if you have much of an overhead or, you know, are really trying to make any money. So, uh so of our 14 markets, you know, most of them are very good. And so it does take more help beyond that, you know. So mostly we have anywhere from three to six people working at each market. And, uh, you know, at, uh, at our best markets, uh, six people is uh, rarely even enough. You know, so so in that case, we hire uh, mostly city people who can meet us there and work less time. And, you know, and those people are are generally enthusiastic and don't get burned out so quick. You know, if you, if you do a grueling uh, five or six day a week uh, market schedule, you end up hating farmers markets, you know, and, uh, and everyone's been there, I think on the right rainy day, if you, you know, had enough to the cheap customer, you got to keep a good attitude. So it's not really for everyone, but uh, you know, for us uh, having at least uh, somebody good run in each market is very important. Having talked about the the restaurant sales, having talked about the the farmers market, when I looked on your website, I, I was actually intrigued. I was intrigued by your CSA um, and the number of options that you guys were offering. You know, you've got the basic fruit and veg, but then you've also got the chef's premium box that you pack, and then you guys are also offering home delivery. Talk a little bit about how you're managing that kind of diversity in 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 creating options for your members, because you know, like everything else that you're doing, the more the more things you offer, the harder it is to manage. Yeah, you know, I've kind of taken a a mixed approach on the CSA. Uh, I, uh, you know, the option of doing like a custom pack CSA is cross my mind a lot, and uh, I see the appeal, but uh, logistically uh, and packing uh, seems very tricky. So, so we we do offer pretty much a standard share, and that is most of all the shares we do. You know, and it includes fruit every week and uh, a little higher price because it includes fruit every week. But, uh, you know, $40 a week share is our standard share. Um, I've tried to keep it very simple. In fact, uh, you know, uh, we do a half share, which is just every other week. And uh, so that makes it much easier. For a while there, I was doing a smaller share and uh, it just left too much room for air, you know, uh, either people taking the wrong shares or, or whatever, you know, but if you get all, if you get 10 emails a week about this or that, it just drives you nuts. So, so we've tried to simplify the half share and the standard share. I do offer a chef share that, uh, you know, I get, I get a relatively a few takers, you know, and that's for more enthusiastic people that want to spend uh, $65 a week and, you know, they'll get, uh, 15 to 20 items in the box and more apt to get things like zucchini blossoms or wild mushrooms or, you know, things that I'm not going to put into a standard share. Um, this week, this year we're working with, uh, 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 
producer of uh, jarred items as uh, an add-on. And I've never really worked with add-ons, but uh, we're going to play with it a little bit this year and uh, and see. You know, like I said, the the CSA has kind of been my pet project, and I've and I've been experiencing growth. You know, we've we've slowly gotten up to 450 members. Uh, you know, this year I'm doing home delivery too, which is a uh, Potentially, I see it as a big potential, but, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, I'm working with a third-party delivery service that is, uh, you know, seems to me the only realistic way to to go about a home delivery. You know, to to cover the Chicagoland area on any day would be just too much without a a third-party company. So they'll pick it up and uh, and deliver it same day, you know, essentially, and... uh, for added cost that is put on to the consumer. So, so for no added cost to me, really, they're going to, they're going to do that. So we'll see how it goes. You know, it's a learning curve for me. I, uh, I've been willing to try anything that works and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I still see growth in the CSA industry, you know, despite all the, uh, all the talk of, uh, there being, uh, you know, stagnant, I think uh, there is potential. It might be getting a little saturated, though. With that, we're going to take a break, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Todd Nichols from Nichols Farm and Orchard in Marengo, Illinois. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible through the perennial support provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort B and Fort Light potting mixes. Vermont Compost Potting Soils are a really special product. I used Vermont's Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we get great transplants with it. And I mean really great transplants year after year, and we save time, money, and management hassles compared to mixing our own. At a time in the organic movement, when we're seeing more and more companies jumping on the organic bandwagon, Vermont Compost is a reminder of the art and craft of making a great organic potting soil. One thing I've always appreciated about Vermont Compost is their ability to put out a consistent product year after year. And in something that's subject to as many variables as market farming, it's nice to have something you can count on. VermontCompost.com And by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time and increasing the number of buyers your farm can work with overall. Use the software to inform your buyers about your farm, your product availability, delivery days, pickup locations, and more. With Farmer's Web, your customers can place their orders online, or you can enter them for buyers who place their orders by text, phone, or email. You can define payment terms for different buyers, give select buyers special pricing, and generate pick lists, packing slips, and product catalogs for your customers. You can keep track of payments that you receive by check or COD, or buyer payments by credit card go right into your bank account. Farmers Web can even help you coordinate deliveries with neighboring farms. You can pause, cancel, or switch plan types from month to month at any time, even during the off-season. FarmersWeb.com. And we're back with Todd Nichols from Nichols Farm and Orchard in Marengo, Illinois. Todd, you mentioned that, that this farm was started by your parents, Lloyd and Doreen, and that you've also farmed currently with your brothers, Nick and Chad. What's your role on the farm? Because I mean, obviously you're not you're not doing everything with that many people involved. Yeah, you know, uh, I've grown into the role as uh, you know I'm pretty much head grower. You know, uh, I'm also uh, a CSA manager, and I'm also uh, you know probably I like to think of myself as the ideas guy. But uh, you know, so we all have our roles, but. Uh, you know, I make the, I stay on the farm every day, you know, except for Saturday. And, uh, and the, that is uh, where I want to be, you know, to, to be active on the farm, making management decisions, uh, you know, cropping systems and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff is, is what I spend most of my days doing. And, uh, you know, and working with so many different crops, uh, it is, uh, it's uh, definitely a challenge, you know, uh, we have a fair amount of greenhouse crops too that uh that uh I'm a quite a bit a part of. But uh, you know, and then my brothers, you know, my brother Chad is mostly in sales and uh and my brother Nick uh manages uh my brother Nick manages all the restaurant sales and uh he also manages all the greenhouse plantings and that kind of stuff. So so, you know, it really is important to delegate, you know, and try not to worry about everything. Because if you just stick your nose in every component of the farm, you'll 
you know, for one, you'll never get anything done. And, uh, two, you'll end up, you know, really frustrated that, uh, you know, you couldn't do it all. So, so I try and stick to the field and that's where I want to be. And as, as head grower with so many acres and, and so many crops, do you actually spend time on the tractor or is most of your work going around and figuring out what needs to be done and then making sure that it gets done? Um, that's kind of how I start my day. Uh, I do actually do all the planting, direct seeding. Um, you know, I, I'm fortunate I don't have to do hardly any cultivating. And, uh, so I've got a couple of guys who, uh, mostly do that. Um, we've got a guy who does all the irrigating, you know, mostly. So I don't have to, you know, I don't have to worry about that too much. So I'm mostly in charge of any, uh, you know, succession planting and, uh, you know, just, uh, trying to keep it all together. You know, my, uh, I meet with, uh, with our crew foreman every day and give him, uh, you know, uh, the outline for, uh, you know, any special orders that were, you know, any special directions were going that day. But, uh, you know, we're lucky to have a crew that's been with us for so long that, you know, I really don't have to walk everybody through everything every day. And, uh, and that is a big component, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I spend an awful lot of time driving around and, uh, you know, a big, uh, uh, one part of our farm that, uh, I, I think is of great value is that, uh, you know, our, our farm is spread over four different farms actually. So, so we have, uh, an 80 acre field that's a mile and a half to the north of the main farm of the main farm, which is, uh, you know, 220 acres, mostly unirrigated there. And then we have, uh, 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 85 acres down, uh, two miles to the West where we have our new packing shed. And, uh, and then we actually, uh, part of our land, we trade, with a agronomic farmer neighbor and uh, we farm uh, we trade him uh, two of our acres to one of his acres but we're under his central pivot irrigation so uh you know center pivots uh not great for everything but you know if you're talking like corn and and beans you sure can't be just calling your neighbor and saying hey turn on the water that's part of the deal you know so compared to our other, our other irrigating systems on the farm. So, so anyway, back to, back to the crew, but, uh, you know, so I have a guy on irrigation and, uh, you know, and, uh, and then my dad is involved. He, uh, he actually kind of manages the orchard. Well, my dad, uh, my dad, uh, mostly, uh, he runs the orchard now. And, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, making the, the, the spray commitment of, uh, of an orchard is uh, pretty time consuming itself. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, over 10,000 trees on, uh, over 40 acres of orchard and it's kind of his baby, you know, uh, 243 varieties on, you know, 10 or more different rootstocks ends up giving you an orchard that's almost un, uh, unnavigable to, uh, to most people. There are literally, uh, all varieties of trees all over the place. And, uh, so the orchard is still his thing. And, uh, you know, he's in his early seventies now, so he doesn't want to do a whole lot, but, uh, he's still involved and, uh, and he likes to, uh, he likes to run the orchard and, uh, and take care of that. It's interesting to me that you're so spread out. I mean, you talk about two miles in one direction and a mile and a half off in another direction. Um, that's a lot of, that's a lot of space to manage, even just from the standpoint of moving equipment, because, Tractors just don't go that fast down the road. Luckily, newer tractors go a lot faster than older tractors, but uh, still, it is a lot of downtime. So there are some serious negatives to being spread out, but uh, but they're kind of offset by the positives. And uh, you know, it's hard to think of it as a positive, but uh, I can't tell you how many times we've had adverse conditions on one field and not the other. You know, whether it be hail or wind or or uh, too much rain, no rain at all, um, you know, disease. Uh, you know, a couple of years back, we had uh, late blight. That was, you know, the worst in years, a few years ago now. But, uh, you know, the late blight and the tomatoes totally took out all the tomatoes on one field. And the other field was okay. 
you know? So, so that kind of geographical, uh, you know, diversity really has come to our aid in so many cases that I can't even count, you know? So it, there are definitely logistical issues with that, but, uh, you know, where we're at too, there's different soils around, you know, uh, if I could go back, I would have put us all on a sandy loam and, uh, you know, in the right soil, but that wouldn't have been good for apple orchard, you know? So, so the geographical diversity has got some pros and cons for sure. Um, but, uh, it is, it is hard to, we lose a lot of time and a lot of production. Uh, you know, I try and multitask every time I, I do make a trip and, uh, but I end up driving a lot. And how are you guys handling that with harvest? Um, you know, we, we break our crew into three crews and, uh, you know, they each have a, a cube van that they go around and, uh, there's one designated driver. So, uh, you know, they mostly, uh, you know, do the, you know, traditional things like picking the grains early and, uh, you know, uh, crops like that, you want to get out of it early in the day. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, they, uh, one crew will mostly stay in one field and do all the things that are over there before they move on. When it comes to, there's always one guy who's kind of a driver and, uh, and he will, uh, he will drive back to the farm and take any crops in every you know hour or two, he'll come back to the wash, the wash barn and, uh, and bring the crops over. But, uh, you know, it's tricky. It's, um, but we're doing the best we can as far as trying to save time but there's always room for improvement. So circling back to the family, how do you guys work together? Is it, is there, do you guys have formal structures in place for communication or is it kind of on a catch as catch can basis? How do you guys actually work together in this business that you all own together? <laughs> uh, you know, you'd be surprised that we even function as a business some days, you know, uh, we actually work, together uh best by working apart you know it's good that we all have our own thing and uh you know there are components of the family that don't always uh you know like any family business it's not all hunky-dory and uh and it, it is tricky uh as far as formal in writing types of things you know mom and dad are still the patriarchs and, and matriarch you know so they they've got the final say on most everything and uh and uh, until uh, until that time, uh, you know, the brothers and I are uh, at some level of mercy. But, uh, you know, it, it's tricky. It's really hard to work with family business. You know, feelings get hurt and uh, everyone's not on the same page always. And work ethics are different. And, uh, you know, it's very hard. And at the same time, working for a family business, uh, you know, like in my case, I my son had a kidney transplant last year and I needed to take off, you know, a fair amount of time. And, uh, you know, the family pulled together when you needed them, you know, on a day to day, uh, you know, it makes Christmas interesting, you know, when you work together, you know, it makes, uh, holidays are a, a little different around our house, but, uh, but yeah, no, we don't, we really don't have any formal, uh, formal structure. You know, it's, uh, it's hard to believe sometimes, but uh, I, at some point, you know, when my when my parents are no longer in the game, it'll be interesting to see what uh, where the farm goes. The glue that sticks it all together is that my dad is still the driving force, and my mom still, you know, keeps him grounded, and uh, and you know, and me and my brothers bring home the bacon. And do you guys have a formal succession plan in place? I mean, that's a, a huge topic now in the farming community is, I mean, not just your parents, but a lot of, a lot of kind of the founding generation of, of the organic and local farm scene are getting older now and are going to be aging out. Yep. Yeah. We, uh, we do have a, a formal, uh, you know, uh, uh, family trust and, uh, and that kind of stuff that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of assets here, you know, I mean, the business just blowing all the equipment and everything is, uh, is something to, you know, to be desired. And, uh, and then not to mention, we all make our livelihood. So, but, uh, but, you know, as we all get older and have our own views on life, uh, I, I, I don't know how it'll work out post my parents, you know, I know I'll be here. 
can't speak for my brothers, you know, but uh, I think we'll, I think we'll manage Chris. Yeah. You know, we're, we are family. It's a love hate thing. And I, and I have three kids and my brothers have uh, three kids between them. And, uh, you know, hopefully they all want to be involved at some level or not, you know, I'm not pushing them into it, but, uh, yeah, I have the three boys in the family, so I got to assume that uh, I've got a small workforce on my hands. <laughs> do you now? You mentioned before the show started that you got you were the kid that got dragged along to farmers market. Do you drag your kids along to farmers market? You know, I don't. Um, you know, when my parents were starting it out, and uh, it was small potatoes. You know, I mean, uh, markets today for us are serious business. I I bring my kids. A, you know, a couple times a year at most, but, uh, you know, I, it's a long day as you know, it's a 16 hour day and, and I work my ass off and, uh, you know, and, uh, I'm dealing with, uh, you know, tons of people and, uh, you know, having a kid at your heels, uh, needing this and that is tricky. As my kids get older, I, I do plan on working them into it more. And, uh, but no, I haven't pushed them into anything and, uh, they're kind of spoiled really. So you mentioned that that one of your kids had a kidney transplant last summer and and that you ended up spending a lot of time off the farm and that the family was able to pull together and and cover for you. But I mean, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, yeah, the family pulled together and covered for me. But it's another thing to be, you know, when you're the when you're the head grower on the farm to be spending. I think you said when we were talking before the show a day a week off the farm, uh, you know, that just that adds up in terms of just missed seeding or missed tilling or missed uh giving somebody direction how did you guys yep. how did you guys handle that um you know uh, a lot of that went missed you know uh and uh and it's not the end of the world you know it, the thing about this is like we grow crops and and we take them personal and it's very serious but at the same time they're just crops Chris. You know, it's not the end of the world if I missed a week of arugula and radishes and, uh, you know, and we didn't have as much spinach at the end of the year or something, you know. Uh, you know, so there were some things that went missed. Um, what are you going to do? You know, but at the same time, uh, you know, at least I didn't have to uh, lose my job over it, <laughs> you know. So it, my family was there supportively, you know, but, uh, but yeah, you miss some, you miss some, you miss some opportunities. But you know that's a big part of the diversity of being a farmer like this is that we don't count on any single crop for anything. You know, I mean, no crop we grow accounts for more than ten percent of growth. You know, so it is that uh, that blend and the seasonality of it. Uh, you know, expanding the season and having the uh, perennial crops and everything. You know, there's quite a bit of buffer that uh that you you got a lot of room for air you know there's no room that there's no year that we don't have crops that completely fail and and to tell you the truth in in 38 years doing this we've never had a year that was worse than the year before really so we've had 38 38 years of growth every year even in the driest year even in the wettest year you know part of that is that we've been growth minded but at the same time, the diversity has led us to a place where, you know, it almost feels like we can't fail. And and I know that's a terrible thing to say or ever to feel, but after you get used to, you know, having uh, successes, even with failures in between. Yeah, I mean, we feel like there's a, you know, without crop insurance, uh, the type of farming we do is uh, insurance in itself. You talk about growing every year. I that's in terms of growth sales is your net growing every year as well um you know uh we try and keep it in check you know so i mean uh after uh after paying ourselves which is part of the cost of business uh you know there uh there's always been net you know some years uh you spend the net more you know so the reality in in farming uh you have like the the fixed costs which are the seed and and all the inputs like that and then you get the much more variable costs, like did we buy a new tractor this year or did we, you know, did we buy a wash line or did we, you know, 
you know, spend it in one way or another. So those, uh, that level of net has been, uh, you know, variable, but, uh, you try and balance it between how much taxes you want to pay on, on profit really. And, and my parents, one thing my, my dad's always been really about is just, you know, he hasn't pulled money out of the farm. He's always put it right back in, you know? So as you grow and grow and grow every year, you know, you put more into it and, uh, you know, and it kind of, it perpetuates itself to the point where, you know, we do have a, you know, an arsenal of equipment and, and all the means to really grow even more. So, uh, it only becomes easier. Is your wife involved in the farm? Um, not a whole lot. No, she, uh, I mean, she mostly, uh, is a stay at home mother, you know? So, uh, you know, and as our kids are getting a little older now, she's, uh, getting out there a little more, but, uh, you know, and, and, uh, in, in certain ways I wish she was, and in certain ways I'm glad she's not, you know? And in fact, neither of my brother's wives are either. And, uh, you know, that does keep that, uh, that autonomy, you know, it keeps me from bringing work home always, you know, if, if, uh, it's, uh, maybe it's on my mind, but I don't have to share with her all the, the problems or, you know, the, uh, the intricacies of what I might be thinking about when it comes to farming and, uh, you know, we have our own interests. So, you know, uh, we like to travel and, you know, we like food and we like to cook and we like to go out to eat and, you know, and we have three little kids that, uh, consume an awful lot of our time and, uh, and having one chronically ill child is, uh, is very tough. So, uh, you know, she is not too involved. No. Todd, do you live on the farm? I do live on the farm. Uh, I have a house on the farm and, uh, and my brother Nick has a house on the farm. So we are, uh, you know, all connected. There's five, there's five houses on the farm. So also our foreman lives on the farm and, uh, and a couple other employees uh, share a house. Now you mentioned that on the farm that's down the road that you guys recently built a packing shed down there. Can you tell us about that and what you did and how it's working for you? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, a couple of years back, you know, we had been working out of my dad's backyard and, uh, you know, slowly growing from the same packing shed and wash area that he worked with in the early eighties to, uh, to our point recently. And, uh, so we decided that, uh, you know, it would be in, in good interest to build a new packing shed down the, down the road. So, uh, we started from scratch and, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we had a, a drive to make it a green building, you know, so we built, uh, the building itself is, uh, it's 140 by 80. And, uh, it's heated, insulated, uh, you know, it's got a six, uh, six bay loading dock and, uh, and it's powered with, uh, there's 140, uh, solar panels on the roof, which creates about, uh, 90 or hundred kilowatts. And, uh, and there's a hundred, uh, hundred foot windmill, which creates another, uh, 20 kilowatts. So it, it, it pretty much creates enough uh, energy on its own to, to power the four uh, coolers we put in there. So we put in four coolers and a freezer. And, uh, and then uh, the building itself is also uh, heated and cooled with a geothermal system. So, so literally about half of the cost of the building was put into these green energy uh, expenditures. And, uh, you know, it's been a, it's a really neat building and it, it's great to have the space to grow. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, ordered, uh, some new wash equipment that we're putting in there and, uh, you know, having the extra cooler space was big. Um, we put a freezer in there. Like I said, uh, we've gotten into freezing crops for a few restaurants. So that's a, another added a value added type thing. We also built a greenhouse out there that, uh, the greenhouse is 80 by 120, and that's geothermally heated. And, uh, which is pretty rare for a greenhouse. And, uh, I don't know if it was uh, totally cost effective. We're yet to see, but, uh, you know, to have a geothermally heated greenhouse, uh, is, uh, you know, is something that my dad, uh, aspired to, 
invest in. So we were really invested in the, in the new farm over there. And we've got, uh, since then we've built six high tunnels, four of them are heated and, uh, you know, we're kind of focusing production over there. And, uh, but, uh, having the space is really a big factor. You know, when you're, you can never have enough cooler space. And we thought we put in four, uh, 16 by 40 foot coolers that are 10 foot tall. And, uh, and it's easy to outgrow those even, you know, uh, <laughs> when you're, when you, when you have a, a hundred different crops on inventory, you really have to have the space to, to, to get in and get out and not unload the entire cooler to get something out of the back, you know? So, so that was a big change for us. And that's kind of our future uh, direction over there. So it really took the center of uh, production out of my dad's backyard and into uh, into a much bigger space. If you could change one thing about that packing house, what would it be? Yeah, you know, uh, what would I change? I would have put three-phase in there. We didn't put three-phase power because there was a big cost. And uh, now that I'm looking at some uh, some washing equipment, that uh, three-phase would have been very advantageous. I would have put more floor drains. County became a little tricky when it came to floor drains. So, so there was a reason we minimized our floor drains. But yeah, three phase power is one that I've I would have uh, changed. With that, we're going to turn to our lightning round. After we get a quick word from one more sponsor, the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farm Commons. Strong, resilient, sustainable farm businesses are built on a solid legal foundation, geared for the direct to consumer and organic producer. Farm Commons free legal guides and tutorials provide a practical and realistic resource for farmers. In my consulting work, I often need to deepen my understanding of the ins and the outs of the legal side of things, and Farm Commons is always, and that's not an exaggeration, the first place I turn. Whether I'm looking for information on building a legally resilient CSA program, the ins and the outs of paying in-kind wages, or just trying to get a better general understanding of how to work with regulators, Farm Commons boils the information down to the nuts and bolts of what you really need to know without having to wade through the regulations. Visit farmcommons.org to access a wealth of information about this important part of your farm business. And we're back with Todd Nichols. Todd, to start off the lightning round here, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Oh, man, that's tough. I mean, uh, of course, the obvious, something like a bean picker is uh, is pretty awesome. Uh, one that I use a lot is a uh, uh, a Ferris poly planter, which is the uh, it's a, the monosim uh, vacuum seeder that uh, that uh, drops it through uh, the Ferris poly planter and pokes a hole in the plastic. And uh, great for planting squash, and uh, I use it for cucumbers and uh, and melons and uh, you know anything I early corn, anything I want to plant on black plastic. It, uh, it's something that uh, I've gotten a lot of use out of, you know, uh, I, I really, I, after I got that, I really liked the monosome planter uh, set up and we ended up going to, uh, I've got a, an NG monosome uh, planter and a MS monosome. So I'm running uh, all monosome vacuum planters and uh, those are kind of my tools of choice for, uh, for my most important job of planting and seed. And, I mean, equipment you said is really important for your farm. What is your favorite resource for equipment? Where do you where do you turn to for information about that? I mean, the internet, of course. Uh, you know, uh, publications, uh, Facebook blogs. Uh, you know, your show. Your show has kind of inspired me. Your your show inspired me to buy a corn picker. Um, you know that and other things, but uh, you know. Uh, Things like that, uh, you know, trade shows are fun too. I always try and go to, uh, you know, the Michigan show or any show that has a substantial equipment uh, component of it is always fun. That Michigan you know, show uh, being the Great Lakes Expo, the right? The Great Lakes show is a, a big expo. Yeah, that's the, uh, you know, I, I've I've always wanted to go to the, uh, the, uh, the big North American one in uh, California. I haven't made it yet, but. You know, those types of things are great. And, uh, you know, I'm always, uh, I get a lot of free time in the winter and, uh, you know, looking for uh, new ways of doing things. You know, the one thing I like about what we do is that we can change what we do and uh, do it differently or do it better. So there's always a better way or, a, you know, a new way to do it. And that's, that's what keeps it interesting. 
All right. And what's your favorite crop to grow? Um, favorite crop to grow? Um, you know, personally, I, I actually like growing corn. You know, and, and, and I don't know uh, if it's because we don't grow it organically or not, but, uh, you know, the, the control of corn seems like something that is, uh, is something that uh, is very reliable, you know, it germinates quick and well and strong and predictable. And, you know, it's not like carrots, like I love growing carrots too, but, but it seems to me like, uh, half the time I have a hell of a time. You know, I feel like a, a successful grower when I grow something that reliably comes out of the ground nice. It's got those nice big seeds and it just and it and it gets up and like you you know that's it is pretty substantial out there in the field too. You know, you, you kinda like you yeah, know you, you accomplish don't have something. To get out of your truck to know that it's up. You know, so there's something to it. One's fun. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? You know, if I would, if I could go back and tell my dad where to buy his farmland, that would be something I'd go back and do. You know, because he ended up buying, uh, you know, we've got a mix of uh, silt loam, clay loam, and uh, you know, not much sand around here. So, but uh, you know, that's something I would do. Todd, it's been a lot of fun talking to you today. Really, really appreciate you taking the time this morning. All right, Chris. Well, it's been fun. I uh, appreciate it. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 103 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Nichols. That's N-I-C-H-O-L-S. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America, and by Growing for Market, where you can get 20% off your subscription with the code PODCAST at checkout. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, you know what? When you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource that you value. You can support the show by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs>